Originally, Steel Pan came about through the, the descendants of the emancipated slaves on the island of Trinidad, mainly in the city of Port of Spain. African descendants were not allowed to participate in the, the festival. There was like an annual festival in Trinidad at the time, around uh, like the week before Ash Wednesday, leading up to that. The French Creole and the, the more uh, aristocratic people in this society you know, did, didn't want the people of uh, Afro descent involved in their carnival and their celebration. So these people of Afro descent, they, they formed their own little bands and stuff. These bands mainly used to come out of the uh, the Shango, the, the Shango Baptist uh, yards. You know, um, the Shango is like a spirit that the Af spirit uh, type of culture that the African West African people brought to the islands, um, and it was very popular in Trinidad. So the, the youngsters at the time would be involved in these yards and their the different uh, celebrations and religious practices, what have you. But they would also um, form their own little groups to, to, to parade with in, in Port of Spain. It's from these little groups that the steel pan came about. That, that's how the steel pan was born there. Um, not being able to afford uh, like to buy like, conventional instruments, they had to create their own instruments. It, it developed over time because the steel pan started on the small, small size uh, drum or pans, and eventually, you know, it, it, it led to experimenting where they, they realized they can use a bigger drum and kind of hammer it down and, uh, you know, make a sound out of that. And, you know, this was taking place in the, very, in the early 1930s. In, in mainly in Port of Spain, Trinidad, and environs, uh, Laventil, you know, these different districts. And um, it evolved over, over time into the, the big size, 55 gallon size drum that we have now. Once I selected the drum, I would uh, find the center point, you know, geometrically find the center point. And um, once that center point is found, I sometimes do concentric circles on the drum. You know, we like run some circles on the drum. And this is the traditional way. It's done with the sledge, sledgehammer. Very noisy, labor intensive process. There's a lot of different things that have changed. Uh, different tuners would prepare it a particular way and would go about tuning it a particular way. I tend to stick to the traditional stuff that I've learned from my dad. I'm aware of how to do it, how these other people do it, but I tend to maintain what he's taught me. And uh, just added a couple things that um, Mr. Manette, Ellie Manette taught me as well. We subdivide it based on the type of pan we want to make. Subdivide it and uh, I've switched to pneumatic hammers now with uh, my compressed air coming through and um, I, I begin to work the shape of the drum from there. Well, you've seen here in the shop, I have smaller drums and I have larger drums. Um, I tend to make the, the larger drums more. Those are the 55 gallon standard, more standard, more traditional for, for, for making the steel pan. So this drum is, is uh, around like the 1940s, early, early 50s, right? So you have... That's the kind of sound you'd get. So the early 
before it, that's kind of how the steel band would, you know, would sound. And there are actually some audio recordings with the steel pan sounding like this, you know, really sort of marimbery, sort of woody effect. My father was born around 1931 in Port of Spain, the district of Port of Spain in Trinidad. And um, the first time he actually heard a crude steel pan, he was eight years old, seven or eight years old. And it was in very, very, it was in his infancy at that time. <clears throat> my father's generation developed into what it is today, this fantastic instrument. By him, you know, him, Joseph Roseman, uh, Ellie Manette, um, a lot of other people in Trinidad around his, his age group. And they were youngsters at the time, early teens, you know, really, it was a play, play thing for them, just having fun. Once um, I've worked the drum on the whole drum, this area that's marked here is where we'd cut it. So we'd cut it that length. So it's around, yeah, eight and a half, nine inches. So we'd cut it to that length and go to the other stage of, of the production of the steel pan. Here, what we're doing is actually adjusting all the, the partials on the instrument to make sure it gets that nice bright uh, a nice bright sound. Just, uh, the hammering is a lot lighter. It's you know just little taps that does a lot. Steel on steel has a, a great effect on this instrument. So with my ear, I can hear what's happening over there with the partials and the harmonics. And that's, that's what's so fascinating, fantastic about the steel pan, that it can be tuned just like a guitar with your ear. The typical music of Trinidad and Tobago is the calypso, the calypso rhythm. So steel pans, steel pans uh, when they were able to play melodies, that's a lot of what was played on the steel pan initially, the calypso. And the mambos were also played, and the um, bossa nova rhythms were also played. Then the you know the classical music was also played. But from a Trinidad perspective, the music of Trinidad and Tobago is the calypso, and and that's kind of where the Trinidad the Trinidad steel pan was. The steel pan can basically play anything. It's a chromatic instrument, so you can play basically any melody on it. You know, it depends on where you're from, of course. You know, different cultures would want to experiment with it differently. And um, so it can, you can play basically anything on it. I'm an artist. This is what I love doing. So. I have to adjust my life accordingly with regards to financial enumeration to continue doing what I love and keeping that tradition that was handed to my father, from my father to me, keep that tradition alive. Um, the, the steel pan as a musical instrument is going to become mainstream. It's going to be just like, uh, or better than, some of the other instruments that are out there in the world today. It's, I see it fitting into the orchestras. Music is going to be written specifically for that, to be played along with uh, the, the classical uh, idiom. Uh, it's already in the jazz world, and it's, it's, 
it's going to be a mainstream instrument one day. That's where I see it.